three parts of agenda today. We'll discuss what exactly is hospital hyperglycemia. Why should you not, and this is the main part, okay, this is, pay attention for this one. Why you should not use sliding scale insulin, right, which is still, despite many years of repeatedly talking about it, uh, it is still used. It is actually harmful to the patient. It's better not to manage diabetes than to give sliding scale insulin. And then we'll discuss some practical tips about hospital hyperglycemia management, including use of insulin, right? So we use insulin pens, and we'll discuss some practical aspects of that, right? So these are the agenda. So what is hy hospital hyperglycemia? Now, see what happens is that any patient who comes to the hospital, sometimes they know that they have diabetes, and they'll come and tell you, they'll give the history that, um, I'm a diabetes, you know, I have a history of diabetes, I've been taking diabetes medicines. Sometimes they themselves don't know that they have diabetes, right? First time they're admitted for some other reason and they are diagnosed with diabetes. Sometimes what happens is that they don't have diabetes, they know that they don't have diabetes, but because of hospital hospitalization, there are certain medications which are given, like steroids are given, or, uh, you know, catecholamines are given, like noradrenaline, etc. Or because of stress of hospitalization, patient or infection, patient can develop high blood sugar. Right? So you have noticed in your, uh, you know, in your wards, patients, you know, who otherwise have normal sugar, when they are admitted, their blood sugars go up, right? So that is what is known as stress hyperglycemia. So any blood sugar, any patient you randomly do blood sugar, and blood sugar is more than 140, right? More than 140, it is considered hospital hyperglycemia, right? Treatment to treat or not is a different issue, but by definition, that is hospital hyperglycemia. Now, where does HPA1C really come into this picture, right? So any patient with a random sugar more than 140, you should definitely send HbA1c, okay? Why HbA1c is going to help you is that there could be two situations, right? Let's say the patient comes, blood sugar is more than 140, we send HbA1c. If HbA1c is more than 6.5, it is pre-existing diabetes. Patient already had diabetes, whether the patient knew it or not, different issue, but patient already had diabetes. If it is less than 6.5, right, that means that the patient did not have diabetes earlier and whatever is developed is stress hypoglycemia, right? This is important from insurance perspective also, because see, when you write notes in insurance, if the patient's HPNC is less than 6.5 and you write diabetes, then there could be insurance related issue also. So it's better to write stress hyperglycemia, right? That means that patient did not have diabetes, patient did not lie in on his insurance form, but because of hospitalization, because of certain medications or because of other reasons, patient developed hyperglycemia. So again, a very important, and this is stress hyperglycemia or hospital hyperglycemia is a uh, is a scientifically valid term, insurance valid term. So again, when you are making discharge summaries, this is a term which you should use rather than uh, use diabetes because then unless the patient already has diabetes, then uh, that would be a better thing, right? Uh, if the patient is having blood sugar less than 140, you do a random sugar, it could be that the patient is having diabetes, but it's well controlled or patient does not have diabetes and uh, or stress hyperglycemia or any type of hyperglycemia, we can then ignore the uh, thing, right? Now, any patient who is admitted in the hospital, uh, we often monitor their blood sugars very frequently. You, we already started using CGM now in the hospital where we monitor more frequently. But at least minimum, we should monitor four times a day, right? Before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner and bedtime, right? Four times a day is standard. You can do six times a day, right? If you want to check more frequently, but minimum four times a day is mandatory, right? Now, a lot of the times I get questions from, uh, you know, medical officers like you that, why are we measuring before and bedtime? So what happens is that when a patient is hospitalized, right, patient gets standard meals three times a day. So let's say in the morning, the fasting blood sugar is normal, but post breakfast, the sugar goes up. That gets reflected in the pre-lunch sugar. So you don't need to separately check post lunch, uh, post breakfast. You can directly ch check at pre-lunch because whatever the hyperglycemia load that is there, it is going to be reflected in pre-lunch. Same way, if you are checking pre-dinner, right, whatever, if there's a PP2BS is high, that will definitely be reflected in the pre-dinner sugar, right? So it's very important that you check at least before meal and bedtime. If you want to check more frequently, then you can do six times a day or seven times a day, right? Before breakfast, after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch, before dinner, after dinner, and 2 a.m. also. So you can check six to seven times, but generally, you know, uh, unless the patient is specifically admitted for diabetes purpose, routine patients can be checked four times a day and we are good with, right? So four times a day is a standard protocol for monitoring. Your patient, for example, it's they are on IV insulin infusion, then you need to check one to two hourly, as you would have seen, you know, Preeti often write this. And if the patient is on a Riles tube or patient is nil by mouth, then four to six hourly checking is generally required, right? So that is the standard recommendation that we generally do. 
what should be the target of your patients in di for diabetes if the patient's fasting blood sugar is less than you know ideally should be or before meal sugar it should be less than 140 all random sugar ideally should be less than 180 but up to 200 is acceptable so less than 200 is generally acceptable so most of our patients we try to target and you have again seen in the ward we try to target a range between 100 to 200 right that's an ideal range right uh, up to 70 to 180 is also an acceptable range but 70 to 180 is something we expect in ho in opd patients in indoor patients we generally target a range of 100 to 200 for that safety margin that we want right okay so that was the first introduction to uh, basics of uh, what is basically hospital hyperglycemia the second thing and this was you know uh, my this is my desire for a long long time right uh, that we abandon this practice of sliding scale insulin right what is sliding scale insulin so tame what my and i still keep seeing you know there are more times i cut sliding scale insulins uh, than i write sliding scale insulin in my life right uh, sliding scale insulin i'll tell you why it is what it is i'll also tell you why it is harmful and why it's a completely outdated practice unfortunately in a hospital despite you know all the glamour that we have we are still doing a lot of practices which are completely outdated Right, which have no basis, completely outdated, uh, random thing which have still percolated. But sometimes, you know, systems, when you have a big hospital, right, you always have changes which happen slowly, right. In a smaller, it was, it was my personal nursing home, it will take two seconds to change, right. But it is a big hospital, generally changes happen much slowly, right. That is a problem. So, sliding scale insulin is you would have, you know, said less than 140, 6 unit, no extra paid, 140 to 180, 6 unit extra paid. That is, completely outdated and also very dangerous process i'll tell you why so we'll you know discuss why uh, sliding scale is bad right so sliding scale insulin is this right you check every sugar every four to six hours and depending on some chart which is somewhere somebody has decided uh, how did you decide it is 140 to 180 give four units who has decided nobody has decided there is no guideline there's nothing people whatever they want they write right there is no recommendation there is nothing like that right okay so it is given as per some predefined and the standard protocol what we generally should follow is what is known as BBC, basal bolus corrective insulin, right? We'll discuss basal bolus, but first we'll uh, understand why sliding scale insulin is obsolete. There are four uh, recommend, four reasons why you should consider uh, making sliding scale completely obsolete. First is basically logic, okay? Now, what is the logic of uh, why you should uh, abandon sliding scale insulin? And I tell this often in my talks. So basically, a hospitalized patient is like a fireworks factory, right? You have seen Shiva Kasi, right? right? You have a fireworks factory. Fireworks factory, the biggest problem in a fireworks factory is that fireworks factory itself catching fire, right? Now you have a lot of ammunition, you have a lot of, uh, you know, gunpowder and people, you know, uh, who are uh, workers who are making this fireworks. Uh, their biggest challenge is the fireworks factory actually catching fire, right? So, a diabetic patient admitted in the hospital is like a fireworks factory, right? Otherwise, he's okay, but suddenly one infection, suddenly one high sugar, low sugar, it's catching fire, right? So, it is basically, problem is, is can happen at any time, right? Patient is a vulnerable patient, right? So, there could be a problem which could happen at any time. Now, if you are, let's say you are manager of fireworks factory, right? Let's say you are the CEO of some fireworks factory. You have two options, right? Lot of you I know want to become CEOs of hospitals, right? So, management, one thing is very important, right? You need to understand that management is always foresight, right? What do you want to do? What do you want to prevent, okay? Instead of, you know, just when the problem happens, you solve it, that anybody can do, anybody, right? Anybody can solve problems. Firefighting, anybody can do. Preventing problem is what is, what is where the intelligence really lies. So, if you are the manager of a fireworks factory, there are two challenges, two solutions you could do. What you do is you have a very robust uh, system where you prevent fire from happening at all, right? You have fact safety checks, you have, uh, you know, regular inspections, you have, uh, you know, uh, everywhere you have put, uh, you know, uh, uh, fire drills, you know, everything you're doing so that the fire, the factory does not catch fire, right? And it does not catch fire and all the safety precautions that are there uh, plus three, four more from your side you have done to prevent fire from happening, right? Now, that doesn't mean that fire will not happen. Fire can still happen, right? Despite the best practices, fires can still happen. But the chances of the factory catching fire is reduced, right? You have kept insulation, you have kept everything. That is one approach, which is the right approach to do. Second approach is, right? So, there are managers like this. They'll say, CEO, okay, 
you know why should we invest why should we think why should we waste our energy when the when the fireworks factory will catch fire that time we will see what to do okay so this is fine but what will happen is when the when the fireworks factory catches fire right it does some damage for sure no matter how early you are how much money you have paid to the fire fire you know uh, factory and all that right damage will definitely happen there will people who will be dying right all your equipment will get burned your your uh, you know entire uh, you know factory will get burned you will still save some people but the damage is already done same way what happens in diabetes patient is diabetes patient is like a fireworks factory any time infection any other reason it can catch fire sugar suddenly goes up right now what is sliding scale insulin sliding scale insulin is when the factory catches fire then you are solving it right so sugar vadiga when the sugar goes up then you give insulin to bring the sugar down but the sugar has already gone up the damage has already occurred right now you are just fire fighting to reduce the damage you are just reducing the damage the damage has already occurred right that is basically sliding scale insulin the better approach is to make a system where that sugar does not go up at all right prevent the sugar from going up so you are preventing the sugar from going up you are preventing the damage from occurring right second problem is in the same light is that when the sugar goes up and this is where the this picture really comes you are actually doing dual damage you are doing double damage i'll tell you why body generally tries to maintain homeostasis right so long time back there was somebody who did an experiment where they kept some cells in a glucose solution right in one solution the glucose value was always high right and the cells were kept in that in the other solution what they did was they kept changing the glucose values sometimes the glucose values went up sometimes the glucose values went down sometimes they went up sometimes they went down so and the third solution they kept the sugar uh, they kept the cells in a normal glucose value right uh, where the glucose was normal so obviously the glucose where it was normal the cells survived the most right because it was in a ideal environment but between the two the scientists were also surprised to see that whenever the glucose went up and went down and went up and went down that is a time when the cell damage actually occurred more compared to a situation where the glucose even though it was high it was constantly high right so whenever there are changes in the blood glucose level when it goes up and down and up and down in that situation whenever there are changes there is development of something called reactive oxygen species right so when your blood sugar was 100 and it went to 300 right that 200 jump led to development of reactive oxygen species pachi apne su karyu we gave insulin which suddenly brought the sugar down back to 100 so you are now going from 300 to 100 again changing the glucose again leading to reactive oxygen species again leading to more damage so a you are you know without you did not prevent from that from happening so you caused damage and then you corrected it did more damage right that is what happens with sliding scale insulin that sugar goes up sugar goes down both the cases there is damage happening instead of that the ideal approach is prevent the sugar from going up that is the best approach from take right so that is the thing there is now evidence there is a study called rabbit 2 trial which was done many years back i think it was published when i was a resident in medicine that time it was 2007 right way back in 2007 so it is whatever sliding scale it is still practice is still outdated it was outdated many years back right this trial uh, was done uh, this was the uh, major breakthrough trial where they showed that sliding scale insulin has no purpose right the ideal approach is to use basal bolus insulin regime right and they clearly showed that those people who were on sliding scale insulin had higher mortality and morbidity right and that is the thing right with a similar risk of hypoglycemia right and this is there was another surgery uh, rabbit to surgery trial where they looked at patients who were admitted for surgery and they looked at similar things right the guidelines are also very clear this is endocrine society guidelines where they says that the practice of discontinuing diabetes medication and writing ssi sliding scale insulin uh, in the hospital right is something you should be uh, is undesirable right in one study risk of hypoglycemia increased three folds in patients who are kept on sliding scale insulin right so that is what the endocrine society guidelines says and american diabetes association 2018 current one also says the same thing this is basal bolus correction insulin is the ideal regime the sole use of sliding scale insulin in inpatient setting is strongly discouraged right this is american diabetes association guidelines right and then indian guidelines also say the same that sliding scale insulin although quite popular has been found to be inferior to basal bolus insulin right so uh, the standard guidelines are there so what is basal bolus insulin regime and uh, yeah 
so that is what we would have seen uh, us generally prescribe. So in this, we give two types of insulin. One is the long-acting insulin, which is generally Lentus or Tugio or something like that, right? So you have a long-acting insulin, and you have a short-acting insulin. Now, short-acting insulin does two purpose. One is the patient is going to eat, so it corrects the post-meal hyperglycemia, right? So when the sugar goes up after the meal, it is corrected. Secondly, sometimes even before the meal, the blood sugar is high, so it corrects the blood sugar to bring that. So that is correction dose of insulin, right? So Lantus or Tugio, whatever is prescribed or uh, whatever basal insulin is prescribed, that you know is a base level. What it does is it brings the complete sugar down to a base, right? So you have seen when we go in the rounds in the morning, we decide the dose of Lantus there and there, right? That time only we decide what dose of Lantus to give, right? We don't uh, generally don't wait for us to for you to call us in the evening to decide Lantus dose. Lantus dose is generally decided in the morning, and Lantus dose is decided in the morning rounds based on the fasting blood sugar. So if the patient's fasting blood sugar is within range, 100 to 140, we don't change the Lantus dose. But if they are higher or we are anticipating that it's going to go higher, like let's say there is some steroid which is added or let's say some patient has, you know, has infection or something, in that case, we increase the dose of Lantus. Sometimes we are anticipating that the sugar can go down. So in that case, we reduce the dose of Lantus. So you would have seen that us, uh, often do that, right? Then you have the short-acting insulin, which is generally we use Epidra or any other you know, rapid Fias, whatever, right? So uh, you know, that is a short acting insulin that is generally given before the meals, right? Where first thing we do is we first bring the sugar down to a base, right? And then we uh, give the uh, insulin to prevent the post meal hyperglycemia, right? So it's all preventive in action, and that is what we generally do. Another thing, uh, now of course, you know, when I first came many years back here, seven years back, uh, that time, you know, this was a constant problem. Patient, if the patient is nil by mouth, the medical officer or uh, nursing staff, they'll stop Lantus. Right? Don't stop Lantus. Even if the patient is dealt by mouth, you can continue to give Lantus. Right? Short-acting insulin we don't give, but if the patient is NBM, you can still give Lantus. Maybe the dose may differ, but you can still continue to give Lantus. Right? Okay. So these are all reasons why you should consider uh, abandoning sliding scale insulin. And then coming to the third part and the last part of today's discussion is the practical tips for uh, you know using of insulin and some other practical tips that should uh, be very helpful for you in the ward and then we'll be happy to take some questions also from you so the important thing is right and a lot of us often make this mistake right now of course uh, you know preeti is always there to uh, help the patient understand how to take insulin and she does a very good job in that right but at the same time you are all uh, medical office in the ward, you should also be aware of this, right? See, nursing staff is aware, but nursing staff often changes, you know that, right? You have some new nursing staff, sometimes they are trained, sometimes they are not trained, sometimes they don't, sometimes they don't know, right? At least you people as doctors, you should be very well aware, aware about how to take insulin, right? So insulin, if you see generally, uh, it is given in our hospital in two forms, right? Either we give using pens, right? Or we give using needles and syringes, right? So uh, the syringe which is there, remember, Insulin syringe are also available in two different colors, right? Now, of course, you know, you are all mainly working in Zyder, so you have not seen too many syringes. Of course, you have seen, but not many, right? But outside, you know, if you work in government hospitals, syringes are all you see, insulin syringes, right? Insulin syringes are of two colors. One is red colored insulin syringe, right? And the other is black and orange color, right? So there's a big difference, okay? The red colored syringe is the syringe which is 40 international unit per ml syringe, 40 IU syringe. The other one, which is which is which is a orange cap, right, with a black marking, that is 100 IU syringe, right? If you use wrong syringe for the wrong insulin, right, it could lead to disastrous consequences, right? Uh, so the old insulin, like Ectrapid or uh, Insulatard or all those older insulin, Mixtard. They are generally 40 international unit per ml insulins, right? So for when you want to give those insulins, you have to use red colored syringe, right? But when you want to give the newer insulin like Lantus or uh, Bezalog or anything like that, then you have to use the newer syringe that is the 100 IU syringe, that is the orange cap. But generally in our practice, we don't use syringes. We generally use pens. Pens are also of two types. You have the disposable pen and refill pen, right? You are all, you are all used to using, uh, you know, disposable pen. Uh, the pen does not have a cartridge, but these, these, this is a refill pen, right? In o OPD, we generally use, you know, OPD also initially we use the, uh, you know, the Solo Star, which is the disposable pen, right? And in your wards, you would have seen purple colored uh, Lantus, which is the Solo Star, right? This is called as an All Star pen, in which you can change the cartridge, right? So sometimes patient will come and ask you that, 
you know uh atom ne mungi pade chai right so what can we do so you can always say that uh, when you after you run out with this insulin we can then put you on a permanent pen with a cartridge right so that in which the cost of uh, in the you know some of you are environmental conscious also will say that lot of plastic is being wasted so with use of refill syringes you are actually saving lot of plastic also so you can use a refill also uh these pens are like, like this right few important tips we always forget and we always should remember in hospital is that the technique of insulin injection right again nursing staff is well aware but you should also be aware right dial the dose right keep it 90 degrees and inject right and keep changing the site of injection right that is very very important i'll show you some pictures where if you don't change the site what happens right these are common problems in i'll tell you trust me uh, if there is one thing which you know whatever practice i have today right if that one reason why i don't need to worry about it is that outside this hospital outside in fact our opd right patients are not taught how to use insulin right 90% of the patient who come to us in our in our opd already on insulin don't know how to take insulin 90% right mistakes can be anything right from completely not knowing how to use it or minor mistakes but most patients don't know how to take insulin right that is so sad right uh, you know you have prescribed insulin but lot of doctors also don't know how to give insulin that is forget uh, patients right so uh, common mistakes right changing the needle changing the site is very very important and there is a needle on top of the insulin right remember that needle is actually single use needle right ideally every time there is an injection you should change the needle right when i keep saying this to my patients patients come and say that sir tumne khabar hai kitla nahi aave chhe needle right one needle is 16 rupees 18 rupees right so okay, every time i take four injections a day right four needles itself will be so much right best case scenario what you can do is maximum two or three times you can use but don't use more than that right uh, so some of course for economic reason if cost is not a issue lot of your patients 14 15 for patient don't worry about cost right they don't talk to about cost right such cases always use re, do not reuse the needle right reusing needle can lead to problem for you right change the needle every time right every time you inject put a new needle right that is something it will cost only 16 rupees which 14 patient for patient will not mind right so uh, always change the needle ideally right that's the thing uh, very very important and another important thing all these insulin should be stored in refrigeration right now we are of course lucky to have winter where you won't have too much problem unfortunately eighth floors and all you don't have refrigeration easily available generally it's not a problem uh, but in heavy summer right uh, air condition is not properly working in these cases you know it could be a problem ideally the temperature should be close to 15 to 20 degrees if the pen is exposed to temperature more than that right the pen can give come uh, you know uh, insulin may not work properly right so it's very very important that it is stored properly and again in, in the wards where you have refrigerators available it should be kept in the refrigerator right and used uh, by the uh, nursing staff uh, and kept packed into the refrigerator so these are important things you should all be aware about right uh, changing of the site is very important right and uh, injection technique is important uh, if you don't sometimes you can develop lipodystrophies right you can see like this uh, near the abdomen right so this patient has developed lipodystrophies is another case where patient has trust me we have seen right uh, uh, you know uh, preeti and i have seen lot of these patients like this also right so it's very very commonly uh, seen problem okay some more practical tips common mistake common common problem i see every day right i have to fight and uh, you know uh, tell hypoglycemia means blood sugar less than 70 right 80 is not hypoglycemia right in fact if you check all of your blood sugar unless you have diabetes all of your blood sugar right now will be close to 80 right 75 80 right does not mean you have hypoglycemia right none of you have hypoglycemia by definition hypoglycemia is when blood sugar is less than 70 always remember this right uh, common mistake we often make and another common mistake right so patient ne hypoglycemia to me sugar pouch out you for heaven sake don't give sugar pouch for hypoglycemia hypoglycemia is not corrected with sugar hypoglycemia is corrected with glucose okay always remember this there are two reasons why uh, couple of reasons why first and foremost uh, the you know sugar that we give sucrose right it takes first it has to be broken down into glucose and you know uh, fructose and that glucose is then absorbed and then the sugar will come to normal so it will take time that entire process takes at least 30 40 minutes right so if you give sugar pouch patient's blood sugar will not come up uh, you know very fast and then it will start going up after few hours and then we'll have more problem correcting that right so uh, again check in your wards you have told this thousands of times also uh, ideally glucose pouches should be available in hall wards right if we are not 
God save us, right? But it should be available. Worst case scenario, I'll tell you what you can do, right? If the patient is hypoglycemic, right? You have dextrose vials available, right? Uh, you can break the dextrose vial, right? Remove the liquid that is actually drinkable, right? You can actually drink the dextrose, right? So you can give that's ideal, right? So you can always take that. Uh, sugar pouches, do not use it. Like I said, you know, it is going to increase the sugar at a much later period. Now, another problem, uh, our problem, is that we use acarbose very commonly. Acarbose, the purpose of acarbose, it prevents the breakdown of sucrose, right? So, our patients so don't give sugar at all, right? Because it is not going to work, right? So, if your aim is to correct hypoglycemia in a patient seen by us on acarbose, sugar pouches are not going to work, right? So, have glucose available, right? Uh, if not, you know, uh, make sure it is available and uh, all you have to give is 15 grams of glucose, right? After giving glucose, after 15 minutes, check the sugar again, right? And if the sugar is still less than 70, you can repeat the process again, right? So that process has to be done till the blood sugar goes more than 70. So this is the standard protocol for managing low sugar. Uh, again, steroid doses, you know, uh, a lot of you are now aware about this, right? But uh, if, again, you're new, uh, steroids, right, can cause wild fluctuation in blood sugar. So if a steroid has been given or steroid has been removed, whenever you call us or Preeti or anybody, right, always inform us that a sugar, a new steroid has been added or steroid dose is changed or steroid dose has been increased or reduced, right? Because this could have major consequences on the blood sugar management, right? So that is something very important. Again, this used to be, see, these are all problems we used to have much more earlier, right? With repeated training and repeated, you know, uh, thing. Uh, these are less of problems now. But again, you know, if you're again new to the hospital, I think this is some things you need to be aware, right? So I thank you for a patient listening and we'll be happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you.